All right, well, thank you all for being here, and thanks for the organizers for the invitation. Um, this has been a really fun meeting. I feel like a lot of the time we go to Origins or Astrobiology meetings, we're kind of hold off in our own communities. And um, the fact that we're at a meeting like this with all plenary sections and getting to interact with some people that we normally wouldn't interact with, uh, it's just a great format. So thanks again to the organizers for setting this up. Um, so as Kate alluded to, I'm an experimentalist and principally an experimentalist that's interested in nucleic acids. But what I want to talk about today is one aspect of Martian geochemistry that I think is particularly applicable to the types of systems that I'm interested in. And uh, with reference to the section, um, exactly how colonization of Mars with bugs would work. So to refresh everyone's memory, um, Martian regolith does not look that different in composition from Earth soil. Um, it's, Mars has what plants crave. It's got the same micronutrients as you would find uh, on Earth soil. You know, you've got magnesium, you've got potassium, you've got sodium. Um, this, uh, what's shown right here, is a regolith simulant. Um, it's one of the more recent ones. Um, you can grow plants on this. Uh, it'll suffice as a medium for growing plants. Uh, one thing that these omit, though, is some of the oxychlorine species, like perchlorate and chlorate, that some of the missions uh, have found. So we actually knew about the existence of some of these dating back to the 70s. Uh, we didn't appreciate it at the time uh, because we didn't have the instrumentation, but the original Viking missions to Mars actually detected chloromethane and dichloromethane. And what they thought at the time was, okay, well, it's chloromethane and it's dichloromethane. There's not dichloromethane on Mars. This is cleaning solvents. If you've ever used brake cleaner, um, the halogenated uh, hydrocarbons, dichloromethane is a big part of it. So that was kind of written off and left until about 10 years ago. The Phoenix mission uh, did some more sophisticated analysis of the soil. And what they found was that there were some unexpected ions in there. Phoenix had what was called an ion selective electrode on it. And what an ion selective electrode does, uh, what they were doing was they were bringing it up to analyze for the presence of nitrate. And so what they had was an electrode that had a hydrophobic membrane, and there was an ion transporter that would only transport ions that were something called kaotropic. And we'll get in the definition of that later, but nitrate was unique among the ions that they expected to find on Mars in that it was one of these so-called kaotropes. And what they found was when they extracted the regolith that they picked up, they got much more signal from that electrode than they expected. And then in a complementary analysis, uh, we'll come back to that in a second, but first of all, this, uh, this idea of kaotropes. So this has been known for about 100 years since people first started studying protein uh, biochemistry. There's a series of ions ranking uh, called the Hofmeister series. And this guy Hofmeister was a uh, Bavarian, one of the first, uh, they didn't have a name for it at the time, but you call a protein biochemist. He was one of the first people that determined that proteins are made up of peptide-linked amino acids. And what he found was that when he mixed the proteins with different salts, they had different propensity to do things to the proteins. Uh, what he was looking at, based on the instrumentation he had at the time, was just whether they made them soluble. And what he found was that if you took salts on the green side of that chart, so something like ammonium sulfate, which we use in biochemistry labs today to purify protein, that makes proteins less soluble. It does something called salting out. If you take ions from the right side, that red side of the chart, those do something called salting in. They tend to make proteins more soluble as well as unfold them. And if you look at the very far right side of that chart, there's nitrate, one of these kaotropes, and that electrode that they were using was going to sense kaotropic ions. But then even beyond that, there's perchlorate. And that's actually even more kaotropic than nitrate. And so that electrode they had could sense perchlorate uh, even better than it could nitrate. And what they found was that if they took that regolith sample and they heated it up, what they have on the uh, Phoenix was something called a mass spec. And what that mass spec can do is look for an ion of a certain size. And so what they did was they heated up their regolith and looked for an ion that weighed 32 atomic mass units. And that 32 atomic mass units corresponds to oxygen. And what they found is you can see that between about 300 and 600 degrees, you get an evolution of oxygen from the sample. And what that's characteristic of is the degradation of perchlorate. And so based on this ion selective electrode analysis and heating it up, uh, they assigned this ion that was present on Mars as perchlorate. So this was really unexpected. We hadn't seen, uh, expected anything like this before. Again, we thought uh, these chlor chlorocarbons that we found back in the Viking missions came from cleaning solvents, but then it started to look more like these actually were coming from Martian regolith. 
This is further confirmed by the Curiosity mission. They did a very similar analysis. Again, using mass spectrometry, they can monitor uh, heating up regolith to see what evolves from it. And you can see that as you heat that up, you get the evolution of some of these uh, chlorinated hydrocarbons, oxygen, and later more oxidized uh, chloride species. And so this is kind of exciting from the perspective of people that were talking about Martian settlement, because it turns out that, uh, you know, for those of you that flew here, when you fly home, there's going to be one of these above your seat here. Uh, and what that is is a chemical oxygen generator. So when those oxygen masks drop on a plane, what's happening actually is one of these turns on. And so surprisingly, above each seat in the airplane, there's a little explosive charge. That's at the top of that there. And what that does is that initiates the degradation of some oxychlorine compounds. So these are filled with things like chlorate salts, perchlorate salts, and by heating those up, you get oxygen evolution, just like we saw on some of these Mars missions. So this is exciting because it looked like, you know, we have Mars with a non-oxygen containing atmosphere. This could potentially be a source of oxygen. Beyond that, it looked like it could be a fuel. Um, ammonium perchlorate was actually uh, part of the fuel for the space shuttle. Um, we've also seen that it's a really energetic material. Um, the explosion pictures that you see the next to the space shuttle are from an explosion that blew up about three or four space shuttle launches worth of ammonium perchlorate that destroyed an ammonium perchlorate manufacturing facility in Nevada. So, you know, it's something that we have to be careful with, but this is a, you know, pretty potent energy source that looks relatively abundant. It's up to about half a dry percent of Martian soil. Beyond that, people got excited about perchlorate because it looked like a source of water. Um, if you're a bench chemist, if you've ever weighed out sodium hydroxide and you were a little lazy about getting into solution too fast, you've probably seen that the sodium hydroxide gets shiny. What's happening there is it has something called delesquescence. It picks up oxygen from the air. So you actually start absorbing oxygen from the air. Perchlorate will do that too. There's been some results where people have actually suggested that even on current Mars, regardless of whether there's liquid water underneath the surface, there could actually be uh, you know, cyclical presence of liquid water because of the hygroscopic or the uh, delesquescent quality of perchlorate. So all that sounds pretty good from the perspective of life, but coming back to this idea of these kaotropes. So these actually can, again, uh, bring proteins into solution or out of solution, but these kaotropic ions, perchlorate in particular, can actually denature and unfold proteins. So what this graph is here is uh, essentially a graph of the stability of a model protein a lot of people use. This is called lysozyme. And what they're doing is measuring the temperature at which it unfolds in the presence of these different ions. And you can see this follows essentially the ranking of this Hofmeister series. Sulfate tends to be a protein stabilizing ion, same with phosphate. Chloride's kind of intermediate, and then iodide and perchlorate, as you get to the kaotropic end of that, tends to unfold proteins. So that's really interesting from the perspective of getting biopolymers to come together in the first place. But what if we wanted to populate Mars with microbes? So one important thing about microbes is that they don't do that much on their own. Together, though, they can do quite a bit. We're all here today because you know, the oxygen on the Earth was generated by cyanobacteria. An individual cyanobacterium can't do very much, but in a population of, say, a mat or a biofilm, those together will you know, work to, uh, to generate oxygen, and this is how we got our atmosphere today. These biofilms tend to be linked by other biopolymers. This is from a pretty recent preprint about a biofilm forming a uh, uh, bacterium called Pseudomonas. Um, it turns out that the biofilms that it forms are actually from nucleic acids that form secondary structures together. So these networks, these cities of bacteria that can work together, are actually linked together by nucleic acid secondary structures. So you can imagine if you're trying to get a biofilm on something like Martian regolith and you have something denaturing there that can disrupt it, this could potentially be deleterious to something like that. Beyond that, if you're talking about a scenario more like what Sarah was talking about earlier, earlier on, as life was getting started, this is a famous quote from Darwin where he invokes this idea of a warm little pond. The idea is if you have a, a very nutrient-rich pool, it's drying down, Drying reactions are the types of reactions we tend to see in life where polymers get assembled. Um, when amino acids become proteins, when nucleotides become DNA, uh, you're losing water. In that situation, if you have increasingly concentrated perchlorate there, that's going to be more denaturing, and that's going to have consequences for the types of things it can assemble. Then beyond that, back to the composition of the Martian regolith. So again, the best simulants we have of Martian soil or regolith 
look a lot like Earth. Again, I'm gonna hasten to add, I'm not a geochemist, uh, but most of these are some form of silicate mineral. And that becomes important because of another factor. If you're a biochemist, you've probably done one of these before. What this is is one of the principal techniques of purifying DNA in a biochemistry lab. So if you wanna extract DNA from a bacterium or something like that, you'll grow it up, you'll lyse it, and then what you'll do is you'll incubate that lysed cell with silica and a solution of a chaotrope. So these plasmid extraction kits, if you've heard of mini prep, this is what they're doing. If you have chaotropic salts in the presence of silica, they'll make DNA stick to silica. And this is actually how the DNA gets purified. You start with it, it sticks, you wash it with ethanol, the DNA is not soluble in ethanol, then you incubate it uh, with more ethanol, uh, you've washed away all the salts, then you incubate it with water and you're in a low salt solution and what happens is that DNA is gonna come off there and you've specifically isolated that DNA. So the ones that we buy from chemical supply houses and use in the labs use refined silica. It turns out though that pretty much any source of silica will work. So on the left there is you know, the ones that we would buy and we use every day. It turns out you can do it with pumice. Uh, it turns out you can do it with diatomaceous earth. One group even took a fluorescent light bulb that broke, crushed it up into powder just to see if they could do it. And that'll work for extracting DNA too. But silica in the presence of chaotropes will bind DNA. And we've actually done this in our lab with basalt, which is a principal component of a lot of these regolith simulants. The same thing will happen. And again, this becomes important because of these biofilms. This mushroom-shaped biofilm picture, this is the type of biofilm that Pseudomonas makes. These are linked together through extracellular DNA. So again, you can imagine a scenario where you're trying to assemble a, a biofilm on Martian regolith, and you've got this high concentration of chaotrope around, which one will denature the biopolymer, but also you're in a situation where you've got essentially the surface of the planet is covered in silicates. You've also got this chaotrope. It's gonna make it stick. So this potentially could impair biofilm formation. Beyond this, another reason people have invoked uh, perchlorate as potentially being a good thing is that, again, it's a source of oxygen. If you want to do it in really crude fashion, you can heat it up and generate oxygen. Another thing a lot of people have invoked is doing bioremediation with it. You can take perchlorate, there are certain microbes that will take it and detoxify it into basically salt and oxygen. So that's arguably a good thing. We're detoxifying, we're generating oxygen, but there's an incredible oxidative load on it. You know, this life ever since the great oxidation event has been kind of coping with the fact that we have this tremendous resource, oxygen, that we wouldn't exist without. But the fact of the matter is that oxygen is also toxic too. If you were to imagine you know, the thermodynamic product of essentially everything in this room, it would not be that different than if we burned the building down. Obviously that's not what we want from biochemistry. It needs to happen in a more controlled fashion. And so cells have basically sophisticated ways in which they deal with the, the damage that's inherent to oxygen. And so I think as we're thinking about ways that we can do this type of bioremediation, uh, we can take some lessons from nature. Turns out one thing that happens if you have oxidative damage to an organism is that the DNA will get oxidized. And usually what happens when you oxidize DNA is that oxidizing uh, site will basically jump around until it hits a G. And it looks like what's happened is some of the organisms that are the most resistant to oxidative damage have either a lot of Gs or not many Gs. And this has to do with some of the ways where they process regulatory sites, some of which are really G-rich and some aren't. But I think we can take some lessons from, for instance, radiodurans, which is really G-rich. But then dictostelium, one of these lower eukaryotes, is actually really G-poor. Both of these seem to have found different solutions to this problem of how do you handle a lot of oxidative damage. Then beyond that, if you look at other pieces of life, you know, we talked, we uh, heard a lot about the ribosome yesterday. Mitochondria have their own ribosomes, but they've actually essentially abdicated the responsibility of making protein. Uh, you know, cells make about a thousand proteins. Mitochondria, they're down to about a dozen. They actually import most of their proteins from the ribosomes in the cytosol, but they have about a dozen that they keep making. And the ones that they make, they make with very different ribosomes than you find in the rest of the cell. What they've done is replaced a lot of the RNA in their ribosomes with protein. And it looks like part of this is because they're trying to avoid some of the oxidative damage associated with uh, having the, that much nucleic acid in it. Some of the other enzymes that undergo a lot of oxidative damage in cells contain iron oxos, so basically iron atoms 
that uh, get oxidized and these uh, transfer oxidizing equivalents through that. They tend to have their own strategy for this where they have a lot of aromatic residues, they're linked to the surface and it looks like they're doing this protective mechanism with that. So I'm about to hit 15 minutes now. Uh, I'd like to leave some time for questions. So just briefly, um, I think microgravity is something that could have a big impact too. Uh, when we do experiments on Earth. Two, one, mark. Mark. This is something okay, we did with the Roxette it? team at NASA last summer. Uh, this is a sounding rocket. When you get about 10 minutes Two, of microgravity, one, if you have a process that is short enough, you can actually get something interesting in 10 minutes, that's a worthwhile way to probe it. But if we're talking about the durations of uh, expeditions to Mars that we're talking about, usually we're doing it with something like a Hohmann transfer, which is taking on the order of half a year or so. So this is more like some, uh, something you would see on the ISS. You're not going to see something like biofilm formation in 10 minutes, but you certainly are in uh, that short period of time for the transfer. What we've seen is that microgravity has an impact on biofilm formation. We know that uh, in some cases, this is because of things like flagella that the bacteria have, but in other cases, it looks like some of this is the ways that the bacteria communicate. So bacteria, again, they can't do that much on their own, so they tend to aggregate into communities. One of the ways that the community decides what to do is with something called quorum sensing. And what quorum sensing is is a way bacteria talk to each other by secreting small molecules. These are some of the molecules that they secrete. Uh, you, the individual structures aren't important, but uh, the takeaway from it is that some are quite polar, which means that they're going to be dissolved in water. Some are relatively nonpolar, which means that they're going to be involved in membranes. And the degree to which something is going to be involved in a membrane association has a lot to do with how it's going to respond to microgravity. Uh, we've gotten to the point where just recently, in the last few years, there's been some nice work where people have developed fluorescent sensors where we can actually sense a chemical event that's going to cause quorum sensing to happen. Actually, before the cell responds to it, this is some really nice work from Ming Hammond's lab where she's developed a fluorescent biosensor that can actually sense one of these small molecules. It's going to be really interesting to probe exactly what we can do with these in microgravity environments. So thank you guys for your attention. I want to acknowledge some of the students that have been working on these various projects uh, and funding sources, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, perchlorate being an energetic uh, anion uh, produces energy when you, uh, when you reduce it. And on Earth, there are actually bacteria that can use that, that energy. So you would think that if Mars does have life, it would have evolved bacteria that would use this relatively abundant uh, energy source on the surface of the planet as a, a source of food. In general, on Earth, everywhere that there's free energy sort of lying around for the right. taking, you find a, some sort of biology that makes use of it. Absolutely, I think it'd be really interesting. I think that the, the ones we know of at Earth that people are using to do bioremediation, um, it tends to be lower concentrations. You know, if you're talking about an environmentally contaminated site, you're talking about you know, milligrams per liter or something like that. So one wonders if there was maybe some past life that could tolerate lower amounts. But I do think that, you know, what you're suggesting would be really powerful, but uh, um, getting it to work with the concentrations that are there that might be present from past life or bio geological process that have been going on for a while, I, I, my inclination is to say that it probably will take some genetic engineering, but I do think the seed of it, it it's quite possible it's there.